A lot of people, they get scared. People talk about non-metallics as if they're a special magical thing that's separate from other painting. It's not, it's exactly the same. How can they find a balance between getting stuff actually done but still enjoying doing it? Try and paint something to the best of your ability. What you'll find is you get quicker. No one wants to see you painting like, like a shoulder pad for three hours. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to Paint Perspective episode 59 and we have a special guest this week. We are joined by none other than Richard Gray aka Demon Rich. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> royalty, yeah. Royalty, absolute royalty. Um, yeah, uh, it's amazing to have you on. Um, Rich and I have known each other since 2014, Yellow Thanatos Slayer Swords. Uh, I think that was the first time you'd entered uh, in quite some time, wasn't it? Yeah, I'd, uh, I won a Demon back in 1999, I think it was. And then um, I did turn up to a couple after that, but that was pretty much the, the last thing that I did. And then, you know, 2014 was the, the big year, the big comeback. Yeah, was, what a comeback! Like, it's up from <laughs> zero to a hundred. Like, <laughs> um, just just for any listeners who may not be familiar with yourself, do you want to just give like a little background on like the channel, what it is you do, how you got into competition painting, what everyone sort of knows you for now, I suppose. Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, well, I've always like done model painting things since I was uh, really young and uh, I also I, I went to university to study illustration and things so it was kind of all it's all been sort of built into me that you know the, the whole process of doing nice freehand on models and and all that kind of thing um and I was like I always loved the, the white dwarfs golden demon was just a, a like a, an amazing thing for me when I was uh, growing up and you know then I got my demon in uh, 1999 and it kind of felt like well that's it i've done it i don't need to worry anymore <laughs> um was that the first time you had entered no no i'd entered i don't know for three or four years like i had so many um well they didn't do finalist pins back then they were like little certificates and i got so many certificates <laughs> <laughs> and um you know there's always that thing same way that you get now for, for golden dm as well where people are like oh it's all fixed or whatever because you know you, you get so many almost there and, and you never get a trophy so uh that, that was quite funny but yeah I, I got the the trophy and then i just kind of like went into painting doing my own thing um i tried commission painting doing armies and that was kind of fun actually and it, it's a bit strange because I was mainly painting armies either for myself or other people. Uh, and then I started doing Titans as well. And that's kind of like where uh, I, I got more famous because I was painting Titans and people just kept saying, oh, there's another Titan. So they're commissioned me to do another one. And I actually kind of hated painting them. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty big kit though, to be yeah, fair. Well, that's <laughs> the thing. There, there are lots of work yeah. just to, to get them just prepared for, yeah. for painting. I'd imagine that a project like that as well is probably you spend as much time on the prep as you do even with the brushes. Uh, yeah, it's more sometimes, especially if you've got like a, a dodgy cast and uh, you know filling, sanding, all that kind of stuff. It was uh, horrible. Uh, also, like I did the uh, the fortress uh, that they that Forge World did at the time, and I was like. I, I don't want to paint any more resin stuff because that was such an abomination to work on. Was that the old one, Ed? Like the gate, like you're talking about yeah, the, the, the 40K, 40K yeah, one? The 40K with the towers yeah, the towers. Yeah, the towers, the massive yeah. gate yeah, and that stuff was like that. Crazy, crazy. The, that the one that I got half of the uh, the holes for, you know, the like, crenellation type area, mm -hmm. um, yeah, they were all filled in with resin. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like an inch or more deep at each hole. I was just hacksawing yeah, bits I'm, out. I mean, Forgeoid has got a lot better over the years. That, they don't make that kind of scene anymore, which is which is a bit of a shame. Um, but I can kind of understand why, considering the size size. But mind you, the new Titans, the the, the size of them and the detail of them, um, casting's got better, so you never know. But but yeah, I know that piece that, that was a great bit of scenery. That so after you completed Golden Demon, then uh, what? There was a bit of a break for you after. Or? Yeah, uh, yeah, a long break. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's like I said, I was just painting my own stuff. I think I'm still kind of aware of Golden Demon. I still like bought the White Dwarves and things. Those were my favorite White Dwarves, always checking out the Golden Demon. But I just, I didn't have any like drive to to get trophies at the time. Uh, but, you know, I, I kept, whilst I kept still looking at it, I kept thinking, I reckon I could do that. I think I, think I could have a go. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Go, like, rocks up in 2014, paints an amazing Thanatar, drops it in. Wind Slayer Sword. It's just the mic, <laughs> just the mic, the mic drop. The mic. Well, the, the thing was with that, I thought at the time I said to myself, uh, if I don't get a finalist pin, I'm going to stop doing commission painting. Because I thought, right, I've got to get serious and mm. actually you know, make some money with it and things like that. Um, so 
that's like I went all in with it. It was like a, it was a tough time for me then anyway because my mother was dying. Mm. Uh, so like I was just focusing on painting to kind of kind of get away from that. You know, it's like a um, like a therapy thing. Almost. No, no, totally. I get. I think that, a lot yeah. of people treat the hobby in that way. Generally speaking, I know that there's a lot of discussion around like mental health and things like that yeah. in in the Warhammer hobby, especially. It seems like there's quite a fair yeah yeah definitely. overlap. It's like escapism. I think is the main reason a lot I of think- people do this. Well, for me, especially because there's just so much focus when I'm painting. Like, I don't really think about anything. It's just purely, mm-hmm. you know, applying paint to the model. So, yeah. um, you know, it's just nice to, to not have to think about anything. So coming out of that then, you went for, was it 2014 that you started re-entering? Yeah. So, so 2014 was the, uh, you know, the where I was putting, like, everything into it. And it was it was an interesting golden demon for me because I'd been away from it so long. I didn't know anyone that was there uh it was just, i was just there with my uh, girlfriend at the time now wife uh, rebecca and we were just wandering around she was she was more into it almost than i was <laughs> and like, she wanted to see how i was going to do and she kept asking people oh, you know what do all the colored colored stickers mean and, and all that kind of thing and i because uh, i had i could only remember from you know ages ago what golden was like i didn't really know what was going on and i was like oh crap i've not got anything <laughs> yeah <laughs> and I, so i was a bit down for a, a lot of the day and so i thought right i'm gonna go and treat myself so i went and bought uh, a night lancer from the, the forge Fallen stand um and even then i i said the wrong name because like the you know all the the knights have you know different, different names, crazy yeah. names yeah uh, and I don't know why, just said, but like I got the Night Lancer rather than, uh, I can't remember which one it was. I think I wanted one with like a chainsaw arm or something. Um, but I, I ended up with it. And so I was like, oh, <laughs> just a crappy day. <laughs> so you, you bought something that you didn't want to buy, but you kept it. And then thinking obviously that you hadn't done all right in the competition, I'm guessing at some point you returned back to, yeah. to, the, to the cabinet. Oh, it was at Fest, wasn't it? It was the main, uh, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was Fest. 2014. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it was um, the, back then uh, when you won a trophy, you knew you got a trophy because they'd put you on the top shelf. So the top three in each category, you were put on top shelf. Whereas now they only put the committed entries up there. So you don't actually know. So it's quite stressful now. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas I always felt like if you knew you had a trophy or not, you didn't have to worry. Uh, you know, having to go up on stage or anything like that. I'm I'm quite a shy person or whatever. I don't really like being up on stage. So that's, it's kind of, it's horrific for me. <laughs> How did you do in 99? Because it was it must have been NEC, wasn't it? NEC 99, was it? Um, yeah. Because that had, that had a stage. Well, no, so, ah, uh, no. They only put the gold trophies up on stage. I got a silver. Oh, right, okay. So ah, you made they, it out. Yeah, we all got... A little handshake uh, down in like a back room. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even realize that. Yeah, they, they took a photo of us, gave a trophy, handshake, well done, off you go. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize that. No, so, no applause or anything. I didn't even realize that because I remember when I was a kid going to NEC and seeing Demon. Um, and because um, I used to do the trip up with the store, you had like mm. the bus, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I just remember the NEC you used to have that long everyone would be clapping and you'd have that, that, that person have the long wall cut yeah. that, that like, bridge of a stuff <laughs> up to the stage. It used to take forever. I didn't realize that he'd done that for the goals. I didn't, I, I thought it was everybody. So it shows my ignorance, but yeah. Um, to go back even further then, what was sort of your, in, like pre Golden Demon and everything, what was your entry point into the hobby? Like, was it something you did as a, as a kid? Uh, or? Yeah. I mean, I, well, I started like the standard, you know, I started off Space Crusade, Hero Quest, that kind of thing. Um, Tried painting those, got some humbrel paints, and big, horrible synthetic brush, just some blobs and paint on. I uh, had no idea what I was doing. I got, I, I progressed quite rapidly as soon as I got some proper paints. And I was trying to copy the sides of the boxes, you know, like on the HeroQuest boxes or whatever, you'd see the, the painted models. So I was like trying to copy that. Um, uh, but then after that, I... I t- tended to try and paint my own designs in a lot of ways, uh, which I just I found it more interesting. Um, and I think that helps a lot as well with just pushing yourself, trying to be creative in, in how you do it rather than copying the box art. Um, I think it, copying the box art will get you very far in terms of brush control, uh, but it can be quite hard then to move on from that because you're so used to having that guide of you know what to aim for. Then suddenly you have to paint something for yourself and you're like, what do I do? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I do think like trying to just 
have fun with painting and things is a big help. So was was it like the standard painting when you were young? Did you have like a break in the middle in your adolescent years when it becomes uncool? Uh, or, yeah. uh... <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, was, I was always uncool, but... <laughs> You're amongst friends. <laughs> yeah, I was, you know, very typical, you know, loving your, your sci-fi and fantasy, computer games, all that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, there was a little group of us all, all the same way. <laughs> um, yeah. I, but I, I was, all, once I got into Warhammer, like I found the, the White Dwarf and, you know, found that there was a, like a thing that people collected and uh, it's quite popular and whatever. Uh, I was always sort of, not not always fully into it, but like I, I was definitely adjacent to it. Mm. Even like when I went to university, uh, I was still buying the White Dwarves. To, oh, okay, because uh, for a lot of people, they say that there's like a, a big break is very typical, yeah. isn't it? I, yeah. I didn't do a lot of painting when I was at university. Obviously, you got other things. But <laughs> 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 there's so uh, the university was it? it you said it was what was it? You don't it was illustration. Illustration. So, well, yeah. it's um, it's visual communication specializing in illustration so like it did cover things like graphic design and photography and, okay. and that kind of stuff but i you know i didn't pay much attention to those <laughs> no fair, fair. I'm, I'm assuming like at that age and even probably like earlier on in your uh i guess competition phase i would imagine not to speculate that you probably didn't see yourself becoming a professional warhammer painter career wise no, no. <laughs> i don't think anyone does so, anyway. so I'm, I'm interested like what what that journey was sort of like you have to remember at that that sort of time period so that was like in the late 90s um and there wasn't like a big internet um you know social media yeah. or anything uh, that w really model painting and stuff as a, a job relies quite heavily on that mm -hmm. uh so it, it wasn't really a thing. You either, I guess, worked for King's Workshop or like, you know, some other company Manifact, studio yeah. or whatever. So but, you mentioned you was doing like commission painting and stuff and around it, was that something that was sort of like building up on the side and then you was able yeah, to like take yeah. a leap or? Um, the, the main leap I actually took was a uh, patron. I think uh, I was reasonably early with that. I think Ben Comets was like a trailblazer. He was, you know, very big on, on Patreon. And uh, I was like, well, he's he's making some money. Um, it's I think it's hard to get into that kind of thing because there's a massive investment in uh, like equipment. It's not just a case of can you paint. Yeah. It's can you explain what you, like it's, there's a teaching element to it as well. So there's a lot of people that paint very well and aren't necessarily good at teaching. Mm -hmm. um, there's also just being able to paint on camera, which is horrible <laughs> yeah not fun <laughs> yeah. Uh, because the problem is you have a comfortable position that you want to paint in mm -hmm. and the camera will be like either one of the other sides or whatever above you but it's not getting the same angle that you're yeah. looking until at until we can implant yeah. cameras in your, in, in your skull. eyes or yeah <laughs> so it's, it's very hard to get the precise look to it and then you're always having to look you know have the, my screen in front of me to just to check that it's still in focus or whatever but even then it's very hard um, and it's just stressful anyway because you're thinking, oh, like, if I, you know, if I get this mark wrong, then I've I screwed it up on the camera. So then, you know, what in, I end up doing a lot is like trying as best that I can to to paint it, showing it. And then like I'll cut that because it's too, like pause it, then work on it a bit more so that I can feel comfortable with what I've done. Then carry on recording, showing what I've done and, you know, just going over it a bit. I think a lot of people, a lot of viewers get the sort of, uh, misnomer that when stuff happens off camera it's to like hide secrets but i don't think a lot of people realize it's just because it's difficult to physically do it in front yeah of lens. It's, it's just people really want to see like i think everything that happens and they assume that if there's something that they didn't get to see that, that not, was yeah. the magic that they missed out on. but i don't think that's true no uh, in a lot of cases it's just also like there's obviously larger areas on a model you know and you don't and if i've got to spend three hours say on like a like a really deep because a lot of my um videos and stuff on patreon are more like for golden demon yeah. potential stuff so even like a small area you're spending hours and hours painting it and no one wants to see you painting like like a shoulder pad for three hours <laughs> <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> it's like, i'm like right i'm going to show you all the techniques i'm using so there's nothing that i'm going to be doing on it that you won't see it's just there's a lot more of it <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah I, th I think that's one of the things like when when you are painting something to that standard and you are trying to show how to do it as well as do it that you there is no quick way of doing it you do it the way no. that you do it and and you know i always say like you know uh, there isn't any uh, an amazon of miniature painting it's it's literally like you have to you have to follow the steps to get to the result yeah and, and 
that it takes as long as it takes. Yeah. Um, and the big problem actually as well is if you're doing like very high end stuff that takes a long time, it's actually getting out the content to show it because, you know, okay, so if I want to do army painting stuff or very quick sort of flashy pictures for, for Instagram, you can do those quickly. But if you've got a piece, say you're doing a golden demon piece and it's like, you know, hundreds of hours and you've done right, right. So I've just done like 20 hours painting his face. Now I'm going to paint this shoulder pad. So I'll put that on Instagram. Then I do the other shoulder pad. So, the, the, you know, there's the same model again with a bit more on shoulder pad done or that now there's a trim added to the shoulder pad. It's like, it's just boring updates all the time, but it takes a long time to do that. Do you, do you find that you rotate having several things on the go so that you yeah. can vary what I'm content posting. Yeah. as well as then get the progress. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but also I, I get a bit bored. Um, but because also with Games Workshop, because they release so much stuff so quickly, there's always something new and exciting mm-hmm. to paint. And what I tend to do is I'll paint the bit that I'm most interested in on the model. And I'm like, oh, so there's a bit more to do on that. But also <laughs> there's this over here. So. <laughs> yeah, there's always, there's always a new shiny thing, which is, I suppose it's good. I mean, touching upon like that it's good it's good that you know you've got the background that you have and you've been through the the eras of of games workshop and 40k that i think a lot of us has i think one thing with, with me and the difference between me and george is that george you only been you've been into this how many years is it now you've been into uh, it? five five yeah. years yeah so like so like this stuff like when i when i start showing george some of the <laughs> older stuff like nothing again nothing to his credit it's quite good actually because his take on his take on 40k and on, on like what games workshop and stuff is is from like the, the last five years or so but then but then having other people to talk to that know how how sort of like the release schedule it used to be. You used to get the White Dwarf one month and there'd be like a couple of models. One minute, kit yeah. or like one model. It was not I, feel, like, I feel like, left out in a way because the way everyone describes it is always so fondly. It's like it was like magical time. And it's a shame because I kind of feel like I've gotten in at like the best time because there's so much content have, and yeah. I was able to learn so quickly. But there's also like so much going on now you're kind of bombarded yeah you don't have time to appreciate it in a lot of cases so like i get some absolutely amazing models that i want to paint and then there's another one and you know what do you do whereas before it was like you just had time to really appreciate the model you would most likely finish painting it uh even the models that maybe weren't as quite interesting you still finish them because you weren't going to get anything else um yeah, whereas now it's it's kind of hard to, to keep up with it. But at the same time, the models are really good now. So. Yeah, the <laughs> yeah. quality. The thing is, you didn't, you didn't have to deal with with metals. You didn't have to deal with oh, horrible it, resin. Horrible yeah. resin. Like, you know, um, won't talk about flying cast. Um, but like, <laughs> uh, but but like, yeah, they're, they're, as much as there are, there is like really good nostalgia to those things at the same time. Like, I think if I, if I could come into it again and have that, oh, I've never got to deal with any of that's like it's still a really good way to come into the industry well, and come into learning it. in that sort of time period then how was it that you learned to paint was it just trial and error and like your own yeah. techniques yeah <laughs> <laughs> um the well you, you had white dwarf and that was it and the white dwarf was kind of like you know paint the rest of the owl <laughs> yeah. exact that kind of thing mean, you know, yeah you, you got, what, so there's one color there's another color and then it's finished <laughs> yeah. Yeah. um so yeah, I don't think I ever bothered using any of the, the guides or anything like that. I I found that I could pretty much figure out how they painted something just by looking at the model. Uh, and I, I'm still like that now when I, I look at other things. So, um, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't think there's any kind of special magic behind painting when I see it. Like, I, I know because I've had a lot of experience. So when I see a model like, and, you know, trying all different techniques and things, it, it's more obvious to me because... No, I've done those myself, so I can see how they're done. Um, but I think a, a lot of people get um, they get scared on, like you know, people talk about non-metallics as if they're a special magical thing that's separate from other painting. It's not. It's exactly the same yeah. as all other other painting, uh, and it's just a case of do you like the look of non-metallics or do you just prefer shiny glitter paint? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's ex- exact, ex- exactly that. Um, well, one of the things that I've spoken about on the podcast on previous episodes was one of my favorite things to do. I guess it's kind of similar to what you're saying is like studying other people's work. Like for me, a hobby activity in itself is like, I'm going to spend half an hour, like just looking at someone's model, like especially when all the golden demon entries come out. And it's like, you say, like just sort of trying to, I mean, <laughs> the difference is I don't have the ability to then put that on a model, but I like to think that I'm starting <laughs> to get an understanding for how things are done. Cause I do very distinctly remember like 
in my first sort of year of painting, when I was starting to feel like I kind of knew what I was doing a little bit, there was still that barrier of like, you look at something and be like, I literally do not understand how they've done that. Mm. But like you said, once you start breaking it down, you go, okay, well, non-metallic metal, if you actually zoom in and just forget the rest of it, like, okay, well, it's just black and blues and grays. and it's, it's just, it's the effect that people are impressed by. But if you actually just watch someone paint it, it's like, it's pretty obvious how it's worked. Mm. Um, and there's also there's a, like lots of different ways of doing it to, so you can have like really shiny non-metallics or you can have quite quite dull non-metallic. The same way as like there's all different materials. Mm. All you're doing is just replicating different materials, uh, which is why I say it's the same as painting anything else. Like you're not painting skin with real skin. You're not, you know, it, it's that when people say, oh, I like metallic paint because it's metal, like metal colored anyway. Uh, it's like, yeah, well, you're not using any other materials for, <laughs> for painting the model. Why is metal so important to you? So, okay, it looks shiny, but if you've painted light volumes on the model, yeah. the metal moves and nothing else does. So it's inconsistent. But I, I mean, I understand that it's nice to see the shiny parts on the model. And to be fair, if I'm painting something like, uh, you know, Legions Imperialis or whatever, then I'll use metallic paints just because... Um, I think it suits that scale a little bit better because yeah. it's quite hard to paint on metallic metal and like a tiny little guy. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, you know, you can very clearly see that it's a, like a metallic type uh, material just from a distance. Mm -hmm. and I, th I think maybe part of the, the mystique around it comes from the fact of the risk of getting it wrong with non-metallic metal is very, very high. So for example, if you're learning to use metallics paints for the first time just at the end of it it's still going to look metallic probably <laughs> yeah. or thereabouts whereas i'm sure we've all had it with like when you're first starting the non-metallic thing you're looking at it and you're like it's kind of like metal but not quite yeah i mean yeah so there's definitely a higher skill level on the early stages um so you know if you're using metallics you just do like a metal layer and then put a wash over it or whatever and it'll look great uh whereas if you're doing non-metallics you you have to like you can do them very quickly, but if you don't know what you're doing in terms of the light volumes, mm. they're just going to look like you know grey with white squiggles on it. Or yeah. whatever. you can often see that when you look at um, like high-end display painters, even like very very early work in progress stuff when they're Sketch. just in the sketching phase, yeah. it still looks they've done barely anything, but everything looks right, and you, it already starts to look like metal. Whereas you might have someone else who's starting to learn out, and they've spent hours and hours and hours and blending it. But it still doesn't look quite right. It's actually the the blending can really mess people up because. Um, in most of the other types of paint uh, techniques and things, the blending is super important to make it look finished. So they apply that same principle to doing non-metallics and you can actually kill the non-metallics because you end up with like a soft, smooth transition. So you actually ruin the light volume and it looks like a, just the same sort of material as anything else, just like sort of caramel colored. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're doing gold or whatever. That's really interesting because I, 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 I've never ever thought about it that way. And like you saying, it totally makes sense. Like when you look at light refracting on metal objects, it's not like a perfect, it's not perfect blended, seamless, no. seamless blend. It's it like the light. That goes back, you know, to the joke me and Joe have had, because I actually said this on a previous episode <laughs> and it kind of fell on deaf ears, but I, that was where I'd struggled with non-metallics before was my brain was going, every blend needs to be perfectly smooth. And then I'd kill all of the contrast and you wouldn't have those big jumps. So it looked wrong. Yeah. So it's like the, the, the same issue there. No, no, it, yeah. it makes perfect sense. But I, yeah, I've never, I, previous this conversation i've never thought of it in that way like when you look at like for example like in a suit of armor or something like that and you look at like maybe like the, the the helmet or the 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 van brace or something and you see the light refracting on it the the refraction of light is actually some in some cases is is quite quite harsh in the way that it is on there like well and the shinier it is as well the less yeah yeah, yeah and also like it depends on like how extreme the curve is and all sorts of things like yeah that, so. yeah no i never thought of that that's quite you've spoken about in previous interviews actually how the way you approach painting and the way you enjoy painting kind of contradicts the way that you're kind of required to for doing this professionally in the sense of we, like myself and James, are people who love to spend hours and hours and hours on a model, but in an Instagram, YouTube world, that's not always the best thing. And unfortunately, because the people consuming that content have got very, very limited time to spend because they've got, you know, wife, kids, lives, jobs they've got only five hours a week to spend on painting. So they want to get a lot done. Yeah. So, so they naturally just gravitate towards the quicker, flashier sort of looking. Exactly. Yeah. But um, one thing that we've been advocating for in recent weeks on this show is like painting for maximum enjoyment. So Actually just painting as the, the aim rather than the process to get to the end product. Yeah. yeah. So I'm sort of, what I'm curious to ask you is like, what is your, I guess, have there been any discoveries along like your career in painting and like you've, 
are you maybe in a spot now where you know what you really enjoy and what you like doing? Maybe you didn't early on. Maybe when you was doing the commissions, it kind of helped you to learn what you do and don't like that sort of thing. Yeah, I hate commission painting. That's why. I learned. <laughs> um, <laughs> is it the painting, or is it is it all the stuff that comes with it? It's well, it's kind of both because one, I hate giving models away afterwards. Oh, like quite yeah. often, people, uh, you know, if, when I painted my own things, so constantly asking me, "Can we buy the model or whatever?" And I'm like, "I'm not interested because I painted it. it like, I painted because I wanted it." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. So if I keep selling the things then I never have anything to show for what I've done. And, uh, but also with commission painting, you tend to have, it's, you have to be very quick and consistent and everything is sort of like the same. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because it has to look good as an army. And I just can't do it. <laughs> 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 uh, because it's boring. It's just boring because... You know, if you've got like to paint a 10 man space marine squad, for example, and each one has to be the same standard, the same finish, there's just so much armor on. It. I mean, space marines are particularly bad because there's not a lot else going on on them. Yeah. Uh, you know, paint, painting 10 of those is just horrible. Whereas, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I do tend to find I prefer painting Age of Sigma stuff just because yeah. I, I find the models maybe not necessarily more interesting, but there's just a bit more going on yeah. in terms of surfaces and things like that. Do you mean the natural inherent character that those models have? Like, like, uh, like Marines are a bit soulless because they're, they're all the same without... Well, yeah, but it's just like, you know, if you look at like the, a fantasy type model, uh, it'll have uh, just different materials all over it mm -hmm. going on, even with the Stormcast, which are probably the closest thing to a Space Marine. Yeah. Um, they still have lots of interesting elements to them. Like they'll have like scale mail parts on them or, um, you know, just variations in parts of the armor and stuff that where space marines are just very space marine. <laughs> <laughs> so what was, that? that's interesting to me initially because I know James is someone who loves just sitting and batch painting hundreds yeah. of models well, no, at like, time. I mean, if you just in, like, because like I said, there's that thing where you can turn your brain off and just paint and things like that. And you really don't have to think too much then when you're doing a space, marine, especially like um, with certain styles. So if you're not whether bothered about like um, light volumes or whatever, you're doing more like an heavy metal style thing, you know exactly what you're doing yeah. for the whole thing. So it's just a case of, you know, I, it's almost like going into a trance. You know, yeah, just paint it's very it. regimented. Yeah, and you can kind of relax just doing that. It's just depending on how long you want to do that for. So yeah. um, it is, I, I don't actually mind, like if I wanted to paint one space marine like that, and in an heavy metal style even, that's that's not too bad. It's when you've got to do the rest of them and then you've got an, an army to go with the 10 men but yeah that's that's too much is that is that why you why a lot of your a lot of the stuff that i've seen you paint over the years is that why you kind of gravitated towards death guard quite a bit because because they they they're, yeah, they're in, got, individually they've got so much going on yeah they're, they're individual and i like painting the, the grime effects and the chipping and stuff like that the chipping was almost like a, a replacement for being able to freehand on them so there's not a lot of opportunity for, for that much freehand on them um with how like gross they are or whatever like, you know you can do some cool banners and things but also there's some like you put some cool colors on there and also so there's yeah you know, and you know if you want to do various diseases for them there's there's a lot of options that you can go with for, for painting death guard and they're just kind of a bit more fun to do that with yeah, yeah totally. so what was the sort of um path to discovery for getting to where you are now then in terms of like just enjoy was there ever like a moment where you thought like oh i actually really enjoy this i just want to do this like all the time um, like, what is it about your painting now that you enjoy the most? If I said, like, you've got the per if you if I said you've got like the perfect hobby weekend lined up, you haven't got to do any videos. You can do absolutely whatever you if want. If I didn't have to create content and things like that, it would purely be golden demon stuff. Um, it's it's the high end. Just spent like getting really tiny, refined details and stuff like that. I, I really enjoy that. But at the same time, that is um, quite taxing. Mm -hmm. uh, I find like I need like breaks doing that. Uh, because I did think at one point, uh, because, you know, like with the, you know, getting the, the models from Games Workshop to, to paint so I can post them on Instagram and things like that, um, because the turnover is so quick, you tend to try and do those a bit quicker. And that was affecting being able to do Golden Demon stuff. So I thought, right, I'm not going to force myself to try and keep pumping stuff out. I'm going to focus on just Golden Demon stuff. Mm -hmm. But that is also too much. And I need that variety, actually, so I can have some fun. Because... You can still do like display pieces, but quicker with like fun techniques. It's just you don't have to just refine them as much. So like we we're talking about with the non-metallics or whatever, you can do very quick non-metallics that look good. Um, and it's only the refinements thing is only for 
uh, really for Golden Demon or very high-end display painting. And so it's quite quite a niche mm -hmm. sort of thing to do. But it's just what I enjoy doing, like I said, because of the taxing element. And it, I just want to, sometimes you just want to try stuff out or mm -hmm. just have fun or like it's a cool model that you want to be able to display. You're not going to use it for Golden Demon, but like, well, I still want to paint it. So, you know, a, a quicker, like a quicker process, but that could still, if I wanted, be refined. Yeah. I think that's... Um, yeah, between those two, that's what I like to do. Yeah, uh, which is annoying as well because, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, as a kid growing up and stuff like that, I played loads of Warhammer games. I, I used to love it, and I don't get that much time to do it anymore. But I still always have the intention of gaming. Um, so at the moment, I'm well. I'm trying to do the Skaven Tide Skaven stuff with the spearhead. So I'm like, I'm going to have a painted army for those. I'm on my second model at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so it's, it's a bit of a slow progress because I've done the thing myself. So I did the Gracie. I was like, oh, okay, that was a cool model. Onto the Claw Lord. And I've straight away got into the thing where I've started spending too much time on the Claw Lord. And I've got all these clan rats to do. And how am I going to do it? At least with the clan rats, I can paint each one individually. Yeah. So that's not too much of a there's, problem. There's a lot of clan rats there's in a, that box. There's a lot of, <laughs> I think for the spearhead though, you only need, 20 i think is yeah it, yeah i think so yeah i think there's, there's a 40 in the box i think there's 40 in the box yeah yeah, yeah. i don't be I'm, gaming is my yeah. last four years gaming has completely gone yeah. from my life but but um yeah do, do you find yourself when you like say for example the claw so you started painting it you're starting starting doing it do you find that um you get into it and knowing what that model is like do you find that you're like falling in love with it a bit while you're painting it and enjoying yeah. it more and more and more and what happens is the initial outset plan of like i'm gonna do this for a gaming army it suddenly goes, oh, actually, I could do Maybe this. Just a little for, bit more. On just it, yeah. a little bit more. <laughs> that's that's what happened with, uh, with my Blood Angels, and that's why I started out going, yeah, I'm going to paint like a, a nice, decent gaming army. And then before I know it, I've painted precisely five models yeah. because I spent like 20, 30 hours on each one because I was just enjoying it too much. Yeah. Plans derailed. But. Yeah. As artists, we know how time-consuming painting miniatures is, especially if you want to achieve a high standard for tabletop or display. Life is busy, and we don't all have eight hours a day to paint. Plus, if you're still early in your painting journey, it may feel that you're a long way off ever owning your own beautiful army for your games. For 10 years, Siege Studios has been delivering bespoke miniature painting commissions to collectors and gamers all over the world. We have a world-class team of artists from Golden Demon winners to ex-studio painters, collating hundreds of years of collective experience. Here at Siege, we offer a series of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget, whether you want a favorite character for your display or a stunning gaming army. We pride ourselves on offering well above the industry standard of quality and our customer experience. To see our gallery, learn more about our services and get a quote now, head over to siegestudios.co.uk or head to the link in this episode's description. So how do, how do you find that balance then? Because obviously you've got to do all of the content for like, you know, your job, but you also, the thing that you love is like the golden demon stuff. So for example, where can someone like listening to this draw maybe a comparison of like, how can they find a balance between getting stuff actually done, but still enjoying doing it? Uh, I don't know. I'll tell you when I figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, I think in those situations where you do have a model that you really like, um, I think like knowing where to stop is actually half of it. Like if you, if you do have that mindset of, oh, I, I really love this model. I want to paint it. Like, I'll tell you an example. Like, um, I think you've painted it as well. Uh, when Dark Strider came out, the Tau, the Tau model, I, I fell in love with that model. I sent to you this morning, actually, like, I fell in love with that model and I just wanted to paint it quickly just to get it done. Cause I really like the sculpt or the pose or like they're just the model in general and some of the little details on it. And I found as I got to like halfway, three quarters of the way through, I was like, Oh, holy crap. Like I really want to paint this properly now, <laughs> you know? And, and the problem is, is that it gets, but I think knowing when to, knowing to take your foot off the gas, maybe a little bit, do you ever do that? Do you ever, do you ever like get to a point where you're like, actually, you know what, like I've got all this other stuff over here or I've got this other entry that I want to do. I am I am trying to do that actually on the, on the Claw Lord. So every, what I'll do is I'll be like, okay, I can spend a little bit longer maybe on the face, paint an eyeball with a dot on it or something like that. You know, that's that's fine. But then some of the other areas on the model which aren't super important, I'm like, okay, I don't need, I can, I can block them in some quick highlights or whatever, but I don't need to blend it. I don't need to, you know, spend a long time on it. You know, the underside of the model, it's a gaming piece. No one's going to look at the underside <laughs> of the model. So, you know, just some, but you all know basic, it's there. That's where know, I struggle. Yeah. That's where I struggle. It's like the internal conflict. It's like, I don't care if anyone else picks it up. No, it's like, I, I know it's there. I used to be like that, especially with, so I, obviously I was painting, like I said, commission painting all these Titans. You have to paint all the interiors, the crew, the, 
crappy little cockpit screen and stuff like that. <laughs> It's so hard to paint those little things in there. Uh, I think in the Warhound one, they're not... Do you mean the servitor cubby holes on the side? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so many of those things I've painted and I hate them because you can't even get the brush in properly. I think the, the Chaos angle. one's worse, isn't it? Because it's got like all the disease and filth um, like spewing out. No, of because you can put like lots of techniques in there. To, like, <laughs> like, like, <laughs> like, <laughs> techniques. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like, I used to do all that stuff, painting the interiors and things. And then I just thought like, I could paint a lot more yeah. <laughs> finished models if I just glue them shut. Yeah, no, definitely. So. I think we were so we said this in another episode, like with um with painting like your gaming army, really you're painting it for the other person to look at it. Yeah. I, I heard someone say like um they like spending a lot of time on the backs of models because they spend most of their games looking at it. Yeah. And that's something I'd never thought about before. Because you're actually when you're painting most things, you kind of you either paint it for yourself or you paint it for other people. And normally I find that when I'm Painting, normally I find the most happiness in painting just for myself but that typically doesn't lend itself to like getting stuff done especially for games no no I mean I used to yeah I, I, I used to just get stuff done as quick as possible to a standard that I was happy with whether we, wherever it was looked from and you don't expect people obviously picking the models up etc like when you when I think you're, I don't know if this is like maybe some sort of insecurity of mine but I where I struggle is if I paint stuff that's not to the best of my ability or like a presentation of what my ability is. I feel like other people will look at it and think of me as like a lesser painter, if that makes what, sense. What, as in like, that's almost like your CV of your painting yeah. you know, on, the, on the thing, yeah. That's kind of why I was reluctant to like do like a, a gaming level, like tabletop army was because I see myself as a display painter and I didn't want to kind of present that forward to everyone and be like, hey, this is what I can do. Yeah, I think, I think when it comes to that, like you, again, you're painting for a purpose at that point. It's like, you know, what well, is this? Ultimately, is it going to be on a table where people can throw dice at it? Is someone going to spill a drink on it or pick it up after they've eaten some messy chips or something? Do you know what I mean? Like, you're, you're not going to put 30 hours into each model or whatever, how many of hours into each model, and then for someone to do that. Like, um, do, you, do you find any of that when you paint like the sort of speed painted stuff that you do for like YouTube and whatnot? Yeah, sometimes, especially with the new stuff. So, like, obviously, we've got it before it's released or whatever, and then we're, we're showing it off. And then you know there's some other painters that have got the same thing, then you're like, oh, you know, if they're painting the same thing as me, is mine going to look different enough and interesting enough to be worth looking at, basically? Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to spend forever on a piece that I'm not going to use for anything else. It's just something that looks cool yeah. when it's done. Um, and like I would have enjoyed painting it or whatever, but like I say, it's not going to be for Golden Deer and it's probably not going to be gamed with. So it just goes on in a little display cabinet and that's it. Uh, so yes, you do think about that but that that part that's partly ego um which is also affected by the fact that you know you have a level of success that you've achieved and you think well you know i have to kind of show that but at the same time i'm pretty confident in what i do so like i um i i trust myself to be able to do it anyway so it's not like a, a big issue you know i can you know if what I've painted, I think I'm happy with how it looks. That's basically the most important thing. Uh, you know, ha have I achieved what I wanted with it? Job done, move on. Um, but yeah, you look at what other people have done and think, oh, you know, maybe I could have spent a bit more time on it sometimes. <laughs> I, think, yeah. I think that's one thing. Keeping up, keeping up with the Joneses is like one of the hardest things. It's yeah, like, it's, it's, part of, it's part of the ramifications of this like social media influencer world as well. Yeah. Yeah, that is one of the bigger. What what would you say, like from, from your painting your experience, obviously from from right from when you started all the way through to the accolades and things you've won? Like, what what to what are some of the things that you uh, as a painter have have found through all the experiments and and trials and tribulations and things that you've done that have really made your painting get you the result that you want, but in a manner which means you can do it as as efficiently as possible. I know you said you spend three hours on the face or for, you know whatever. Uh, like, actually. What, trying as hard as you can to improve your painting like so for example painting a, a model to the best of your ability for a golden demon or whatever it doesn't matter it doesn't have like, i always think in terms of golden demon but ultimately a golden demon doesn't mean anything it's just like a fun competition or whatever but you still can paint like if there was no golden demon it wouldn't change what i'm doing yeah yeah so i would still like you know you try and paint something to the best of your ability what you'll find is once you've done that you get quicker at doing the other stuff mm -hmm. um, because most of the time you doing it's the same technique it's just more more of everything you know more time more refinement or whatever but it's still the same 
kind of processes. So you can, uh, so mod, it always, you're constantly improving. It means models always take longer to paint for the, the high end ones, but <laughs> you can very quickly knock out something that looks pretty reasonable uh, if you want to. Mm -hmm. So you find it sort of trickles down then because you've yeah. like you've put the hours in on this. It means that yes, doing the simpler things becomes easier. Because what it is is you've learned brush control, you've learned that how the paint moves, all that. You you have a, you're learning all the time. Uh, so when you come to something, you'll know if you do a brush mark a certain way, what what mark it'll make. Uh, which is what a lot of people struggle with when you know they, they come to painting. They're just looking at the final result. What, what they want to get to and they don't know how to get there. Mm -hmm. But when like a like more experienced painter um, looks at it, they're like, right, I know exactly the steps to get there. Mm -hmm. And it's the steps along the way that you're practicing for the final result. Mm -hmm. Are there some like key projects that you've worked on previously that were like um, big turning points in like maybe mistakes that you made or something that you learned from them? Is there any like projects that stick out where you think, oh, that was the one where I really learned I needed to do, you know? X. Uh, I don't know. Not big mistakes. I'm always like uh, looking at the the models, thinking what would I change. Mm -hmm. um, I think at the moment I'm more interested in uh, more saturation on the model. So I'm, what I'm starting doing now is just glazing on contrast paints and stuff like that, or inks, whatever. Um, you know, the same kind of thing. Uh, but just to, to push the the saturation more. Um, mainly so they stand out better in the cabinets. And go <laughs> yeah, I was going to say to you actually, I don't think I've ever said this to you, but like in, in all the times we've spoken and like in uh, 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 um, competitions or whatever, one of my favorite things you painted, I mean, you painted some amazing stuff. Obviously, your Mortarian is like prolific in the industry. One of my favorite things you actually ever painted was the Terracotta Knight with a green trim. It was for the oh, Heresy yeah, yeah, yeah. That that for me, because of the colours and because I think it had metallic trim, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. That yeah, was something totally yeah, different yeah. that I, I hadn't seen anybody at that point ever paint something in a terracotta colour like that. Cause you don't like cracked it was like masonry. It almost looked like like a, like but with like a green metallic trim and I and I know it had like loads of is it floor? Is it because you're 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 I put um like bones and feathers and like uh, bird stuff that was it because you yeah. you had your blue lancer that had the shield didn't yeah you? And then that I was, think, was that each. before or was that after that was after yeah. that was after yeah but at that terracotta night it was just something totally different i know i know it's quite a long time ago but um but yeah it really stood out for me as something that like that because it was like a scheme that it was, it was just it was a color scheme but also at the same time it was just like i hadn't seen anybody most people when they do nights and stuff like that they they paint them like like robot, like big robots, big metallic and stuff like that. Where it was way more kind of like, as I said, like mace, like ceramic in its in its, mm. in its way. It's kind of interesting actually because that did really badly at Golden Demon when I entered it. So that was what caused me to paint the Lancer. Really? <laughs> yeah. Was that the Lancer that you bought? For, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it came all circle, <laughs> it's all yeah. linked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, mega. Yeah, that Lancer that Lancer had a filled in shield as well, didn't it? From me, so it's correct. I just I just made the shield. Oh, okay. So it was yeah. a plastic art. To what? I say, mate, like the, the shield itself, I made from plastic card and then sort of bent it. And then all the connecting points are just chopped off and stuck on the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No fair. It's funny that that Lancer was the one that you got when you went yeah. in Thanos. It came full circle, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. I was expecting that. Which and also is funny is so when I won the Slayer Sword with the Thanatar, I also won the Forge World Best of Show. And the Lancer that I bought won the Forge World Best of Show. Oh, wow. okay. Oh, that's crazy. I didn't realize that. Yeah. No, that's fair. connected. Yeah, it's all, it's all linked. If you're a long-term listener of the podcast, you'll know how important it is to have the right tools to aid you in your painting. And if there's one piece of equipment that I could never live without, it's my Onyx lamp from Native Lighting. It doesn't matter what brush or paints you have if you can't see what you're doing in the first place. The Onyx is the perfect lamp for miniature painting because it's super bright, 2,200 lumen LEDs cast soft and diffused light on your models without any harsh shadows. And its daylight balanced color temperature of 6500K gives you the confidence that the colors you are painting are accurate. As someone with a very small hobby desk, by far my favorite feature though is its articulating arm, which clamps to the side of your desk, maximizing your workspace. It's also super adjustable so you can sit comfortably in the perfect painting position without sacrifice. It also folds up into a compact shape, which is great if you like to travel to paint with your friends. To upgrade your setup and order yours now, head to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop or head to the link in this episode's description. Okay, so something that we thought would be fun to do would be like a little bit of a head-to-head -head sort of critique session. Um, Richard spoke about like how he likes to critique his own models and like learn from them and such. And we've started doing this series called Critique Clinic now where me and James give 
some members of the community feedback on their miniatures. So we was curious to hear sort of Rich's live thoughts while he critiques models so that hopefully we can sort of learn along the way the things that he's looking for and so on. Uh, so we've, we've geared you up with an onyx lamp and you've got my, uh, my blood angels in your hand there. What are your uh, initial thoughts? Yeah, so when you're critiquing something like this, you always have to remember the context that it's made in. So before we were recording, I asked you, was it as like a golden demon entry or something like that? So I know if it's like a it's supposed to be a very high end piece, but you told me it's it's like a your gaming standard. Like, <laughs> it, but it's for for a gaming standard, it's actually really really good. Uh, and to be honest, something like this would be very easy just to push up to a golden demon standard type thing. Uh, what I would say is, though, obviously, it's a uh, heavy metal style. So uh, if you are going to do competition pieces in heavy metal style, you are then competing with the very best who do <laughs> yeah. heavy metal style. Because <laughs> there's, like, it's, it's straight away, you can see the difference between the best ones and some that are just proficient. Um, but for these, yeah, these, well, they're amazing in terms of, like, gaming pieces. They're really, really nice. Uh, I would say things like the, the metals are a bit uh flat like there's there's not a lot going on with some of the metals and some of, you could have some sort of def definition around them bits like on the uh like the little metal um connecting point on the uh the reef thing on his uh, leg is just it just looks silver where it connects as, and also i think you've actually got a little bit touching the flat of the the red um so it needs like shading and definition around it, like just even like a tiny black line or something to wash over it um, before you do the, the metals. Um, then the uh, the lines on the um, loincloths, mm -hmm. um, those are a little bit rough. I mean, like it's it's not something I would say that people <laughs> would put on uh, like gaming pieces. So the fact that it's just there is actually like a positive, but the uh, the lines are not consistent. They're different lengths you know, there's a different gap between the edge of the cloth and sure. the line at various places i mean there's like there's, there's not a lot wrong with them in, <laughs> you know <laughs> i'll take that i'll <laughs> take that <laughs> i would say the banner and this is it's, it's more an irritation due to the heavy metal style but the banner um the creases are not hard creases on the banner but you have painted hard lines on the creases uh so it, it it looks awkward to me because it's like a basically it's painted the same way as the armor yeah for, for the edges and then you've done almost the same thing again where you know where you do like a little final dot highlight or whatever just to make it bling and then on the crease on the cloth you've done the same thing so it's like it's the same material almost um which you know i i feel you could separate the banner a bit more and just do a bit more with it as well That's fair. um and also like the uh the text on it is is pretty good. I would say be a bit careful with the shading on the material of the, or, or, you know, the strip, the, the name of the te text on, because um, you've shaded it down and it sort of hides the text almost. Uh, and then also if you go back with the folds as it curls around, the back one's lighter <laughs> than the, the front ones, even though it curls around behind. So it doesn't really make sense, uh, you know, in terms of the, the shapes and the way the shadows would fall. But yeah, you know, they're very good. The, the edge highlights are super sharp, super neat. I don't like edge highlights on the insides of panels next to trim. It doesn't make any sense. I know um, the Games Workshop sometimes does it. I still don't like it, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it just looks weird because you've got like three lines. So you've got like a red line, then a, like a light gray line, then another like, you know, it's just... No, I, I, always, I don't I always, understand it. I always thought it was because there was like a recess on the inside on that on that on that you've got like the armor panel and then like yeah. you have like a tiny recess by the trim. But the, the recess is dark still. There's there's the recess there that's dark still. So it goes like light, dark, light. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair. Yeah. Um but yeah, no, I mean they are really, really good. And uh, I'm you know, I'm just being harsh for the sake of it. So. No, no, I appreciate it. Yeah. I think that's one of the good things, though, is that like it, it, we've always said this. Like, I think it's better to to just be factual with people because you then you then get given something that you can then quantify and then go right. Well, do I want to do that or not? Or is well, that we spoke about previously, like, and this is part of what we said with critique cleaning. Because like a lot of people often say, "I'd like feedback on this," when what they really mean is, "I would like you to say nice things about this." Yeah, and like that's never if you're looking it's to actually learn. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, um, and I think as well, like giving 
it, it's unfair to ask someone to criticize something and then to get mad at them because they said something critical. Do you know what I mean? hundred percent. Yeah. So what, what are the sort of key things that you're looking for then when you are like holding a miniature like this for the first time? See if it works or not. <laughs> like you, you have to look at, like I said, context matters. Uh, so, and the context of the the setting and what's going on on the model. Um, you, you know, if someone's painted something with a really dramatic atmosphere and lighting and things like that, you're judging does the atmosphere and lighting work. If they haven't done like these, there's there's no atmosphere or lighting. So I'm not going to be like, well, the, the atmosphere and lighting is crap because that's not what the aim of the, the painting is. So it wouldn't be right to judge it in that way. Uh, so you're looking at it kind of in a more big picture sense rather yes, than looking at if, the tiny specific details. Well, it, it's both. Like if you've done a bad job on the, the types, <laughs> tiny <laughs> details, <laughs> that is also going to be a problem. But it's like you have to look at what it is that the, or try and understand what the aim of the thing is. If I can't understand what the aim of the, the piece was, it might be my fault, might be the, the painter's fault. So, you know, um, experience helps with that kind of thing. But uh, That's quite interesting to hear because I think that... Um, myself previously and i think a lot of people have the assumption that like when competitions are judged for example all they're doing is just looking for tiny little faults in things rather than like well, you said you're it, looking at yeah it does depend on the competition as well uh games like golden demon stuff has like a slightly different um I, i'd say metrics i guess for for what they pick uh, it's it's important to remember as well that uh, on things like golden demon it's not always the best painter that wins each competition has their own kind of criteria and you might it's not a case of like writing down a score for each individual part it is looking at the, the whole piece so like when i, I judged at mpo we, we weren't picking so like okay the fine details or the the non-metallics or whatever there, there weren't individual scores for each of these pieces it was a case of does the piece work or not um whereas for more like a golden demon piece i, I feel like they do push more for um contrast and sh like definition and like finish on the models in particular is, is kind of important but at the same time uh it also has to fit within their um their gaming not or, or rather their world it's like the the yeah, the law and yeah, IP. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, you can have pin culture which example, which yeah. makes a big difference to the score so you can have things that you think aren't as well painted as others and they actually might not be but the thing that you think is better painted doesn't fit in with the background and you might be what's well, painting competition but no it's a games workshop painting competition mm -hmm. to fit you know it's kind of like what i compare it to is like um because i learned illustration we get a brief when you do an illustration so you're working within a box mm -hmm. uh, and you have to you can be as creative as you want within that box if you're just doing a, an art piece you don't have that box mm -hmm. you just do what you want and you have to uh, it, the success of it is just dependent on do you hit um, like the whatever the metrics of that, of that whatever you want to create? Does it work as as a piece? So the the you know competitions can all be a bit different. So it's not always easy when someone says, "Give me feedback on a piece." No, of course. You you like well, what what do you want to do with it? <laughs> what is it for? Um, that that can be a big thing. So if someone gives me a piece that is like purely for gaming and like can I have some feedback on that. I was like, well, it's not good enough for God Demon to you. And I say, well, that's not helpful, is it? Um, but, you know, so I have to look at it in, you know, what those terms are. But for the sake of this, I can look at this and I can, I can pull it apart if you want. Please do, yeah. I mean, like I said, I, I, you know me, like we've obviously, uh, we spoke lots about feedback and those stuff over the years, Rich, and you've looked at loads of my pieces and stuff. Like I, anything that like, and I always say this to anybody when they're asking for feedback, like it makes perfect sense to um, to ask people that factually, in your opinion, are better than you or that have the accolades or the credentials to demonstrate that they are better because anything that they give you is going to give you the best best point of like, well, I can learn from that. They've That painter that's got more experience than you has, has walked the path further down the line from you. So I think it's really important to get that kind of feedback. I think also as well, if you do put your, put your neck on the line in that sense, like being able to being able to take that on board, whether you whether you want to or not, is is also an important thing. Like, for, so that's why I pre I caveated it for you and said, look, this was an experiment for me. It's something totally different from what I normally paint. I'm just trying to learn loads of stuff, push myself on loads of stuff, do stuff like I don't do lots of texture, I don't do lots of things like that. Like, uh, there's there's things on there that I maybe look at it and go, oh, that's not the best that I've done or whatever. But it 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 is a can exper it is an experiment, you know, and that's that and that's to learn you know so 
But you can be as, as brutal as you like, Rich. You know, it doesn't, I don't, I'm not going to get offended. So, right. So, uh, in terms of the, the text on the model, these are better. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, the edge highlights as well. No, yeah, yeah. I think they're, they're sharp. As anything. Yeah. <laughs> they are super sharp. Um, I do like that you've gone for the textured effect on the leather. I think that is actually pretty nice. Uh, but it, because also it does help a little bit with the, the edge highlighting thing because it's, um, showing the frayed worn edges yeah it, it works like that so even though you're like desperate to paint edge highlights on things <laughs> it's not too bad on this because you've also adapted the techniques so you put the texture marks on the model and then you put like little scratch lines and things coming off of those edges so actually it all works pretty well i, I got uh, some sharp edges in on the red headdress i was like i've got to paint something sh <laughs> something sharp so the headdress has got like these three little bars or something on it and i just squeeze some some yeah, little edges yeah. on but but um, um but yeah I, I would say the uh, the blue and yellow are a bit too vibrant. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> because, so the rest of the model is more muted. Uh, it's got like a certain kind of feel to it. Like mm -hmm. he, he, he looks like he's a bit grubby. He's been worn, um, you know, he's seen action. Uh, and then you look at the, the skin color and you look at the, the yellow spikes coming out of his head. And these are <laughs> very strong. Um, I think someone said the ones on the waist out of the skull look like chips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got a little, a little pack of fries. A little pack of fries. Too, so. <laughs> little snack for later. Yeah, um, that's quite, quite funny. Um, also, I don't like how he's blue and also the guy on the base. I know. Blue and it's, I, I realized that mistake when I was doing it. I was like, I should have had something to contrast. Was, but, wasn't that so that you could shoehorn the rules for the yeah, monthly challenge so, challenge so a bit of a caveat on that we we do the monthly challenges and there was march from a crag and i painted it in march so i was like i okay. want to do an ultra meet you know in an ideal scenario 100 percent. it should uh, it should have something which contrasts a miniature so maybe an imperial fist would have been good or maybe a blood angel would have been good or something maybe even like or a, just uh, not paint him blue and yeah keep the space marine as an ultra marine, like paint potentially paint. yeah 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 uh, again like kind of similar to the metallics on this i just like you could do more with them they're, they're a bit they just look a little bit flat. Yeah. Um, I do like the uh, the little greeny leather loincloth with the dirt and stuff yeah. on the bottom. That's really nice. Uh, I think you could push that sort. Of, that's what I was talking about more with the atmosphere is with this with the like kind of that grimy look to him. I think that could have been applied all over that that kind of feel. I think that would have fitted in. You've done that thing that <laughs> irritates me as well. <laughs> 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 um, on the muscles on the. On the like, you know, the biceps and the, the deltoids and things like that, you've edged them. Yeah. them you know, it, and that's it. <laughs> We're box art shills. Yeah, as you can tell. yeah I'm yeah. so sorry. <laughs> I don't understand the point of it, though. It just looks so, it's like they've got little armor plates stuck on because it's little tiny armor panels of edge highlighted bits. I don't. Yeah, I I I 100% understand that totally. Yeah, I think I stuck to the, I stuck to the style quite hard on it and, and, um, yeah, I wish I maybe I should do more volumetric sort of stuff on muscles and things like that and flesh because it wouldn't, you wouldn't, it doesn't, it wouldn't. Not that the heavy metal like edge highlight style is every edge wouldn't be glowing, etc. But like, you're, yeah, like maybe I should have done it a bit more volumetric on the muscles. One thing that I just wanted to ask you, uh, just to round that segment out, would be if someone um, hasn't got potentially like a, a hobby circle or a more advanced painter to sort of lean on, what are some things that they could sort of do to self-critique their miniatures? Well, you have to kind of learn. You can't just look at something necessarily if you don't have any context for what what it is you're trying to critique. You can't, you know, you could be like, "Oh, I wish I'd done the the edge highlight sharper." Well, I mean, that's an obvious thing, but you know what an edge highlight is, and you know how neat it is. Uh, so, if it's something like that, you should be able to do that yourself. If it's something you don't understand, then you have to go and learn how to do it. So, if you don't understand how to paint non-metallics, and you're like, "Oh, it doesn't look right," I don't know why it doesn't look right. You have to go so go and look at youtube go and look at get reference as well reference is always important look at you know just google it it's, it's there you know just get pictures off of there like there's knights you know armor plates and things like that see how light reflects off of it just look at it closely um, and then try and replicate what you see uh, that, that's the, the main thing i think is there something do you i think i heard you say this before do you take like a lot of pictures and things as you go to find it do you find that it's easier to just like 
critique an image of your work rather than like hold the yeah, model. Yeah, so hand. that's the one of the main things actually that I like Instagram for. Uh, you know, it's handy in terms of work for getting people to see my stuff. But I actually like to put the pictures on Instagram because it's just there, so I can just load up the page and look at the things that I've done. So and I've, quite often I'll do um, multiple pictures of the models I've been progressing. So you know, what, the latest one I can be like, all right, is that working or not? Uh, you know, can I tweak it? The only caveat to that is um, it does work more towards does it make a good Instagram photo when you take the, you know, so you've taken the photo and do I need to make changes on it? Because sometimes when I'm, I look at the model and then I, I take the photo and then I look at the photo and be like, all right, so I can do this, this and this to it and that'll look better. And then when I go back and look at the model again, I'm like, actually, it looks all right from what I've painted. It's only when I take the photo that it doesn't look as good. Uh, so you have to take a balance and obviously people want stuff to look good on Instagram, but don't force things on the model necessarily that it doesn't need. So if you're happy with how it looks, that should be all right. I've definitely noticed on Instagram in particular, a tendency to go towards very, very vibrant, like dramatic, uh, atmospheric stuff, particularly when it's on a black background, uh, to kind of, and the, th the reason that frustrates me is like, I think it's a bit disheartening for people who are sc scrolling much more casually on Instagram. Maybe they, maybe they only paint like once a month because it's like a, you know, a background hobby and they see stuff and they think like, oh, I'll never be able to paint like that. And it's like, no, because neither can they, yeah. if you get what I mean. I think, so you get things like, like OSL is a, a big one. So like some quick OSL and you think, oh, that looks like it's glowing or whatever. And it's like, when you see it in the flesh, it's not because it's paint. It doesn't mm. it doesn't glow. Like you can use a little bit of um, the you know, fluoro. fluorescent paint on there or whatever, and that can make a bit of a difference. But it the thing is, when you look at a screen image, so if you've got like a white on it, and this is also true a little bit for non-metallics, um, if you've got like the the final highlight is a white, when you see it on the screen, it's a, like it, it glows because it's on a screen, but it's white paint. So <laughs> it doesn't look quite the same when you actually see it. Um, and it's, it's something that you have to try and, uh, you know, make something look good in a photo and in the hand. Um, you know, it's not an easy balance. Uh, but, and this is part of why I, I think for Golden Demon that the high contrast thing works a bit better. Is, but it helps it in the, the hand when you see it. So if you can push the contrast a bit more, but you have to be careful because you can lose subtleties. Like if you go for pure tonal contrast, like everything dark is black, everything white, but light is white. Um, you lose a lot of subtleties within that. Uh, so you just, you have to be a bit careful because it, it can look great, you know, for being like super high contrast, but it can, you know, you don't, you, you lose because of that, you lose the, the subtleties within the, the details so like some super fine text and things like that. But that's also only within the context of a very high level piece of painting. Uh, so, you know, you're looking at it like this, so, <laughs> or maybe even with a, a headset on or something just to see these, these details because they're so small uh, and, and fine. Uh, and it's like it's something that people will never actually see unless it's in the photo. So it's, it's all a careful balance, the, these kind of things, I think. Do you, do you, do you find that you, um, You'll start darker and add color, or do you start lighter and then t and tint down? Uh, most of the time, I start darker and then move up. But you, again, you have to be careful. Uh, it frustrates me no end when I see Instagram pictures of things where uh, you get like non-metallic areas, and then the dark area is just basically black primer. So the the painted the highlights in, and then the dark contrasting section is unpainted. Yeah. yeah. Uh, whereas you know you, you can't do it. like it looks fine on the photo because you've got. You know, it's, it's really strong high contrast and it makes the, because of the, the black element, it makes the shine really shine mm -hmm. because of the contrast. But when you see it in reality, it's just a black unpainted area. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, it depends what you, you want to do with it because in the photo, if you're just working for something purely for social media or whatever like that, you're going to waste your time painting the, the dark area and with like dark, you know, subtleties in that, that area, a bit of rust or whatever. Mm. Because no one will care. <laughs> no, no, exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, you're you're quite right. I, 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 it's just really interesting for me, like when you, the, the, the whether you do start dark or do you do you start light? Because it's like you, you said, obviously about adding more saturation and stuff. And, and do you, did you find that as you're doing going down that journey of adding more saturations and stuff, are you is your starting point? Is it staying as dark as you normally would, or are you, are you going um, slightly brighter? Or yeah, so what I'm actually finding is um, if I over highlight things like mm -hmm. some painting and textures or whatever paint them in quite harsh they look 
almost obnoxious with how how bright your highlight chips them. yeah uh but then you can go back and you can glaze like a game inks or whatever over the top mm -hmm. that dulls them down but it also pushes the the color uh, because it's a lighter base that you're working on because it's over highlighted so the color stays stronger mm -hmm. um, and you also still get the detail that you painted in but it becomes more subtle as well right okay we frequently hear from you with questions asking how you can paint like our team of world-class and award-winning artists Teaching is something that all of the team here at Siege are very passionate about, and we want to share with you the methods and techniques that we use to paint every single day, all of the incredible miniatures and armies that you have seen from us. With the Siege Studios Patreon, you'll gain access to a growing catalogue of over 300 step-by-step -step tutorials covering a huge variety of colour schemes, miniatures, painting styles and techniques, from beginner-focused foundation tutorials to full character masterclasses. Each lesson comes in a beautifully designed and easy-to-follow PDF format with accompanying artist commentary with new tutorials added every single week. Your subscription also includes access to our private patron channels on Discord so that you can interact directly with our artists asking for questions or feedback. You'll also be supporting the podcast directly, helping us to bring you these episodes every single week. So if you want to take your painting to the next level and make the most of your very valuable hobby time, head over to patreon.com forward slash siege studios okay our final segment on the show is a closing tradition which we call hobby hacks this is where we share a quick little tip or a product or something like that with you that you can implement into your painting and we was talking about this off camera actually uh, i asked you the question of do you use magnifiers uh, like a magnifying headset while you paint and you said that you've got like a diy solution yeah um i tried out so many headsets and i hate hate them all uh, <laughs> I, I know this is always the same one or two that people buy the, from Amazon or whatever, like these horrible little you know, white plastic things. They, they're they always uncomfortable for me to wear, especially because I have glasses on. They have like the nose bridge and, and all this kind of crap, and it gets in the way. It's really uncomfortable if you're wearing them for a few hours, uh, and I just wasn't happy with that. You know, it just, it's junk. Uh, <laughs> so and because it's junk, I didn't mind like customizing it. So <laughs> I, I, I basically cut all of the, the elements off, so it's just the, the glasses that are left and the connecting point. Then I got some foam and some duct tape <laughs> and I put uh, a foam bit so it will go on my forehead so it's, it's comfy to wear and it pushes it a, a bit away from my glasses. So there's no nose bridge anymore. And then do a strap that goes over the top of my head and then it goes around the, the side as well. So there's, there's no other resting point on it. It's super light because it's just duct tape. <laughs> And it's comfortable. That's the main thing. It's comfortable to wear. I mean, that's one. I suppose that is one of the most important things while you're painting is that you are comfortable. Yeah. But no fair. I mean, like that as a product, Rich, if you ever want a little nest egg, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, I think. My gripe with Joe put me on to the magnifying headsets. And initially I was like, this is brilliant. I should use it for everything. And I found that the more I was using it, it was like messing with my depth perception enough that when I was simple things like rinsing the brush, like putting paint on the palette, I was like sort of, like, I, I try not to use them all the time. Um, I think you can get into the habit of just painting fine, focused details constantly, and you lose uh, perspective with the, the whole piece that you're painting. It all becomes about the detail, and you sort of obsess about very minute things that, again, you can't see mm. when if you don't have a headset on. Uh, so you have to be a bit careful with that. So a lot of the time I'm painting without a headset on, and then if it comes to refinement or super fine details, I put the headset on uh, just because it's easier. I've actually found a similar thing with uh, when I take photos of my models, like we talked about earlier. I'll take photos of them and like zoom in to find to find problems, like to, things that I can improve. But then I'll pick up the model and I'll be like, eh, like I can't actually I can't actually find it because it's like so <laughs> tiny. Yeah. If that makes sense. No, I mean I was doing that. I was painting the head on Abraxia, the, uh, the new uh, Chaos uh, model, and I altered her head a little bit, so I'd got rid of like the details on the forehead and stuff and just painted her like a, a normal person but the thing is she's got these scars on her cheeks and if you follow the scars they actually go up into the eyes she doesn't have normal eyes sculpted but i painted them like normal eyes and then the whites of the eyes when i zoomed in i could be like i can see the little mark where it's touching the white of the eyes for the scar uh, and it's i was like but when i looked at it in the model even with my headset on i couldn't see it yeah <laughs> <laughs> it was driving me nuts but when i looked at it in the photo i could see it it's like, oh, I can't deal with this. So I was just spending ages keep painting in the little white of the eye highlight at the bottom for the go over it. <laughs> yeah, she's a great model of Braxia. Yeah, she's yeah. amazing. Brilliant. Well, uh, that was a very educational episode. I feel like I've, uh, I've learned a lot. It's fun tapping into, into the mind of Richard Gray. Uh, is there anything that you want to like promote? Yeah, join my Patreon. Oh, I've got my uh, website as well. My uh, lovely wife, she runs my website. So it's got like the same content as the Patreon, but um, it's kind of nicer to use, I think. <laughs>
Very nice. We'll have all of those linked in the description of this episode. Thank you, Richard, for coming on once again. And thank you, everyone, for listening to this week's episode. We'll catch you all next week. Bye.